Welcome to the Front Runners in Sports Management 5 Sports Conference in the American College of Greece. I'm very happy and honored to coordinate the discussion of the very interesting topic, exploring the challenges and opportunities of youth basketball development in developing countries, and present your distinguished speakers, Mr. George Laukas, Euroling legend and one of the 101 greats of basketball, Mr. Anastasio Trajanos, Bolton Lunch and Girls Club Sports Development Manager, and Mr. Joseph Nicolaidis, Head Coach, DECA Academy. Of course, I was hoping for a two on two scrimmage after the session, but this should have to wait since uh, this is an online event. And concerning the subject of our topic, I believe that all working in the sports industry or actively involved in sports truly understand their power to affect people's lives. After a small research for today's subject, it is very encouraging to realize that governing bodies have now the same perception after years that the importance of sports in the development of children was sidelined. This is why the United States Agency for International Development published a study named the role of sports as a development tool, which stated in the executive summary that sport has the capacity to transform the lives of individuals and concluded dozens of organizations and programs around the world have tapped into the power of sport to promote development and peace. More specific, in basketball, there are many projects in developing countries or corporate responsibility programs, such as the FIBA Asia Development Plan 2013-2016, four years to become a force, mm -hmm. where FIBA Asia has undertaken a massive and ambitious exercise to prepare all its national federations to gear up for the challenges of and in taking basketball to the next level. Another program is the NBA is shooting for growth in Africa, youth engagement and community investment. Across Africa, the youth population is set to double by 2050 and through basketball, the NBA is helping these youth to learn life skills that can help them in the future. Another program that probably Joe can give us more details is the Euroling One Team. One Team Euroling Basketball CSR program supported by Turkish Airlines as the One Team founding patron and with the collaboration of Special Olympics as proud partner uses basketball to achieve real social impact in our communities. Last but not least, and in order to give the stage to our distinguished speakers, what was really amazing and strongly demonstrating the power of sports is a study published in Rwanda by Sema Maboko Didier, named Basketball for Change and Development, a case study of an international basketball foundation project in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Where after the 1994 genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda, Sports were intensively utilized to rebuild the country by engaging the youth and the wider community in peace building goals and objectives. For this reason, different sports were utilized to spread messages of peace and reconciliation, gender equality, and prevention of diseases among others. Recently, basketball as one of the popular sports in Rwanda was used as a tool for changing lives of underserved youth and families. After this, I hope interesting introduction. I would like to ask our speakers for their thoughts and personal experience. So maybe dear Joe, the stage is yours for your uh, initial uh, thoughts or uh, statements about your vast experience and travels around the world. <clears throat> Of course, you, of course, you had to start with me, so everybody else is happy that I have to be the first one to speak, I assume, right? 
<laughs> you are a great speaker in any case. I can uh, watch you in every game and I enjoy yeah. your broadcast. But, that, so, but that's when there's something in front of me that I could speak about. You know, this is a little bit different, but I think everybody else is relieved. So I'll take the stage. I'll, I'll be the team player today, you know? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you know, let me express my gratitude. And it's a great honor to be here with all you guys that are doing so many things, you know, for, for youth basketball, for kids basketball. And of course the, this front runners, I think this is my second or third time as, as part of it. So I want to thank, you know, my friend Aki said at active media and, and thank everybody for, for letting me be a, be a part of this. Um, I'm, I'm very short and I'm very sweet about these things. And then maybe as we go on, we could have a little bit more conversation as far as, as far as the incredible programs that that you mentioned, um, you know, obviously we we hear about these programs. We're not we're not a big part of them, you know, as as maybe some of us would like to be, or we don't have enough time to be. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be in one of them, which is one team that, that you mentioned earlier through uh, through my association with your league, and um, you know, it's 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 interesting because I feel like one team does so much for you know not only because we're it's a, a special olympics as being a sponsor but also because it's given opportunities to people that um that don't have the opportunities to be go to games to see the players to be on the court with the players and you know we play games with them we do social events with them and and uh you know the 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 amazing thing for me is uh, you always feel like you're giving, you know, I always feel like I'm giving back and it makes, I think it makes me feel better than it makes the kids feel sometimes, you know, you, you walk away with an incredible feeling of gratitude and, and thankfulness that you're able to maybe impact somebody's life in a way that they've never been impacted or, or in a way that they may never be impacted again, but you may be able to change their life, whether it's a special Olympics, whether it's, you know, people that don't have the opportunities because of their financial situation or because of their their family situation. So it's you know it's very special for me to to be a part of that. Um, as far as you know, youth basketball, I coach a couple teams. Um, I coach the what would be called the JV team and a varsity team. You know, the thirteen to eighteen years old. You know, the thirteen to fifteen year olds, the sixteen to eighteen year olds. Um, and you know it's 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 a different situation for me because I'm at an American school. It's a prestigious school where you know a lot of the families are very well off and they make you know good money and they're able to send their kids to a, a, an incredible school. But sometimes it's not about um, you know with these kids. It's not about teaching just basketball, and it's not about teaching just sports. It's about teaching um, values for life. You know, and and I think that's what sports brings to us. Um, yes, there's a moment where where people who get into sports, to basketball or football or 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 whatever sport it is, and they want to take it to another level. But everybody on this panel knows that taking a sport to the next level and being a professional is one of the hardest things to do in life. So what you have to do is take out the best parts of this. And and I think coaching and mentoring is uh, mentoring is probably a better word than coaching. You know, I could. I can coach my players and I can tell them what to do on the floor and and I can tell them where they need to be and when they need to shoot and how we need to set plays up. But I think the mentoring part of that is the most important thing. You know, we live in a we live in a society today where, um, you know, it's so much easier to stay home and play PlayStation and text your friends on WhatsApp and Instagram and, and Facebook or the X, they call it now, um, than it is to go out you know, like I did when I was 12, 13, 14 years old and grab it, you know, I had my baseball bat, I had my football with me and I had my, and I had my basketball with me and I went to the playground and I looked for people to play with. And, and I don't think that happens as much anymore. So that's why I feel like mentoring is a better word these days than coaching, because you're actually teaching these kids how to, how to actually live life. And, and and be not only an athlete but a student and be a good person. So, in my experience, you know, I haven't had a ton of experience with youth basketball in in developing countries. You know, um, I would love to. You know, I'd love to be a part of it someday. Um, but 
with the experience that I've had, I can say that I, you, you see the you see a decline in the amount of of people that really, really want to be involved in sports for the real reason, you know, and that's they, a lot of them are sent there by their parents to to almost for us to be babysitters, you know, and, and watch the kids for two hours after school okay. instead of taking it serious. So each person, each parent has their own role. Each child has their own role. But I think the coaches and, and the people who are taking care of these young kids growing up um, are the most important things in their life. I know for me, they were the most important people in my life. I could still name some of my coaches that were an influence, whether it's a good influence or a bad influence on me. You know, it goes both ways. Um, bad influences could take you away from a sport. They could take you away from wanting to be within a team atmosphere. Good good influences will, will keep you there. But, you know, I think for me personally, I took the bad influences and I made them better. I, made, I, I took them as, I know this is going to happen. I need to be more of a team player. I want to become a professional athlete and nothing's going to stop me. But I've had those mentors along the way that coached me, that, that told me what life was like. And even though when we're young, we don't listen to them very often. <laughs> Do you know, as, as we get older, we tend to learn that uh, that they're a lot smarter than we were. Same with our parents, I think. And I, I'll finish there and let, uh, let the experts talk now. Now, I was planning to go with Anastasia, but you gave a good pass. So I would like to ask uh, Yosef, as a coach, because you mentioned mentoring as the one of the most, if not the most important thing for a coach. What do you think, Joseph, about how important is mentoring these uh, young children? Because maybe less than 1% will finally play, let's say, professional, uh, have a professional career. Exactly. So, um, it, it's an honor for me to be here with you guys uh, uh, our job is uh, very important we're uh, we're teachers mentors and teachers for for the kids and uh, we need to to make them uh, we need to to build uh, good good habits uh, for them uh, as you said, uh, only only a small percentage of them are gonna play professional, but we're gonna uh, make them. Uh, we we wanna make them um, the the uh, good people, uh, good Welcome. people for the, for the society we live in. In our academy, uh, Deca. It, it was founded in 2015 and uh, uh, we go for uh, nine years now. It is in the western part of Thessaloniki where uh, the people there are not very uh, good economically. Um, uh, it was founded by a former uh, prof uh, professional basketball player uh, Nikos Hadzivretas also played for the national team what he wanted to do was uh, to help young uh, young uh, kids and young athletes uh, to have a chance and as somebody was uh, some as somebody gave uh, that chance to him to uh, to make a professional career as they helped him as a, as a young uh, person. Um, we have a mission there, and uh, our mission uh, uh, focuses on uh, healthy competition uh, rather than rivalries. Uh, we value the participation over winning. Uh, we focus on, on team building uh, as well as individual development. We want to help kids become better athletes, but uh, most of all, become uh, better people for the society. Mm -hmm. So, Anastasios, now you live in uh, England. You live and work there. I saw you said uh, a very interesting uh, presentation 
about uh, what is a developing country. Maybe you can give us some insights on this. I found it very interesting. Yeah, hello everyone. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this prestigious event. I'm delighted to be here uh, with you today and talk about youth basketball development uh, and also to share my views on the subject with all of you. You all have a wealth of experience and knowledge uh, on this topic and I'm delighted uh, to be part of this conversation, first of all. Um, so how we started, like I was uh, talking with uh, Akis and Active Media about the topic and then uh, I believe that no matter what sport, if it is football or basketball, uh, especially here in Europe, uh, people, including fans, uh, professionals and policymakers, often focus too much on the senior elite level. And uh, youth side, the youth side and the developmental ages uh, are often neglected. Although you said the scene very well, you and Joe, and also uh, Joseph, uh, about your work that I've been doing in, in Thessaloniki with DECA, uh, there are a lot of projects all over the world about youth development, but compared to the elite side, uh, I think it's, in, it's neglect, neglected. Um, it's not a secret that every achievement in elite level, success or failure, uh, it's a result of a long process that begins in childhood. So I think there is there is there needs there is a need big need uh, of uh, developing the youth side or focusing more on the on developing the youth side because they are the the future stars the future fans the future managers sports managers or uh, even like people uh, they're gonna make a better society and uh, we all know and embrace the the social skills or the life skills that you can develop through sports this is uh, out of the question so obviously. Um, influence from my personal journey in sports from grassroots to uh, professional level uh, and considering my passion about sport and education I was uh, delighted to, to speak about and provide my insights around this topic. Uh, as you said uh, about my presentation earlier it's very, it's very important sometimes to, to start with, uh, with a definition of what is developing and what is an emerging country uh, and that uh, often is not, uh, that classification is not only based on some economic uh, factors and indicators. So I want to give a, a small definition uh, around, um, uh, to help us distinguish between develop and developing countries. So developing countries uh, refer to the nations with emerging sport infrastructure, limited resources, and lower levels of competitive success. On the other hand, Developed countries have well-established sport infrastructures, advanced facilities, and uh, also maintain high levels uh, of success in uh, big and major events. Uh, that might be one country, might be uh, very, very developed in football, i.e. UK, but not in basketball, or it's developing. Basketball is emerging, is is uh, is developing here, but uh, they've done some good steps, but it's not quite there. So that's why I wanted to first highlight some key characteristics of um, of uh, what uh, what a, a good uh, development youth development program would look like. You all mentioned some key points, but I want to to summarize. First uh, is uh, accessibility to facilities, both in time and uh, and in space. Uh, for example, here in the UK. Uh, we have cricket, we have indoor cricket, we have netball, uh, we have uh, volleyball, that all those games played indoors. That means that the time that kids have to or are able to spend on court for basketball is limited. Second is um, accessibility to qualified and uh, quality of coaching and other supporting staff. So those two uh, key characteristics automatically can make a big difference. So to give you an example, we have, um, let's say we have a young player uh, of uh, a country, let's say a country, uh, that practices uh, four times a week for one and a half hours and has a good qualified coach, FIBA level or high level, mm -hmm. uh, and have a game per week. And uh, we have a second player, same age, uh, in a country B that practices twice per week 
and uh, have a game per week. And the coach is, is, is are qualified, but to that calendar standards. Uh, automatically, the, the player from country B needs to spend twice as much time as the player in country A to be in the same level. Obviously, when we talk about youth development, it's not as simple as uh, as maths, because there are other factors that they, 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 they are involved in this uh, process. But uh, considering the skill acquisition um, uh, model and the research that says about the 10,000 hours uh, to, to reach the associate uh, states of skill acquisition, you can understand that there's a, those factors are highly, highly correlated. Uh, so that, that was a brief introduction from me. I, I hope to, to explore some challenges uh, with the panel and then possibly give some suggestions based on our experience and knowledge. You know, in one of my trips to the States, I met with uh, Fran Daphne, the coach in uh, Table University. And I asked him, do you have all the resources here? Uh, so many assistant coaches, equipment, everything. What if you were in, a, in another country? And he told me that the basketball is all everywhere the same. I used to coach using a, a chair as a basket. Uh, do you believe in developing countries? It is the resources that they lack or a, a well-organized program in order to progress in uh, basketball. Is that a question for me? Sorry. It is for it's one of you. Maybe we can continue yeah. with the same order in order not to keep Joe so many hours <laughs> silent. If you believe that, uh, you know, we have so many players, uh, let's say, like Dick Novisky, he played. I, I would like to speak on that. I would like to say that uh, for for Greece the previous years, and as they as we had uh, some successes in basketball, uh, it wasn't about the money and the resources we had. It was about the passion of uh, the people who were involved with it. It was the people around the sport. It was the coaches. Uh, they had they shared the same passion and that's what uh, it was all about and that's what brought the successes the previous successes so if we let's say we are in an african country that uh, they have huge talent there but they lack resources what would help them to progress in basketball a well organized program coaches or uh, the love for the sport. I believe they have the love for the sport, but they lack uh, organized, a, a well-structured organization. So? Well, look, in my opinion, I think, um, like Yusuf said, that the, your passion is, passion is always number one for me in anything that I do. Um, if I don't have passion for something, I, I, I elect not to do it. Uh, coaching at a high level is a great example. Everybody asked me why I never became, you know, a, a, a professional coach. And I only wanted to coach kids. And, and it's because I don't have that passion. I have the passion more for the kids and, and, and for giving back that way. And, and it makes my life a little bit easier also because I don't have to worry about losing one year and being moved to another country or another city and, and whatnot. But I think the I think the question that you originally asked, I think it's a two-way, it's like a, a heads and a tails, you know, on a coin. Because if you have the passion, you have the talent, but you don't have the resources, it's di very difficult to move to the next level. And on the other level, like uh, like we talked about it in the UK, you know, it's you don't you don't consider the UK an undeveloped country, so to speak. But if you consider the sport, like Anatosia said, is it's an under underdeveloped sport in a very developed country, and there's no passion. So you have the resources, maybe, but you don't have the passion. If you have the passion, you don't have the resources. So it's kind of like a two way street, no matter how you look at it. 
And it's very difficult sometimes to combine both of those things together. Um, you know, in countries in the USA, of course, they have all of the, the resources, they have all the people, you know, 375 million people. You know, it's to me, it's still amazing that the USA can't find a good football team. You know, and a, a soccer team, I should say, American football, okay, but with 375 million people and all the resources we have, you'd think that maybe one year they'd win a gold a World Cup, you know, or, or something. But uh, they're always behind because there's no passion for soccer. There's no, there's no, it's not, it's not like it is in the rest of the world, you know, but you put a, you put a football, an American football in their kids' hands when they're younger, you're a baseball like me or a basketball, then man, there's, there's everything for you. And right now in America, the resources for, for European football, soccer, is there. It's been there for many years since my kids who are now 30 were younger. But there's still no, there's, they're still missing that passion. They're still missing the, the love for the game because it's not as visible as, as other sports are. So I think your, your question is a very good question. Um, and it's just, it's a difficult situation. I, you know, my experience in Spain is when I came to Spain, we, when I was American, well, I still am American, but I feel more European now than I do American. Actually, I've been here for so long that, that, you know, it was all basketball. It was 100% basketball. When I came to Spain, it was the physical part, the weightlifting part, the go out and run sprints in the, in the golf course or up in the mountains the basketball practices were, you know, a fake here, one dribble, shoot, fake here, one dribble, you know. And when I came from America, I was like, man, this isn't basketball. This is this is this is BS. You know, that I, I don't like to do this. I just want to play every day. But you see what's happened in Spain over the last 20 something years. The the resources where the coaching was there, which I think is the most important thing. And all of a sudden, basketball became a passion for many people. And now Spain wins World Cups. They win European championships. They have incredible players playing in the NBA. So I think when you combine all those things together is, is the perfect mix. But in so many countries, it's difficult to do, whether or not it's a developed country or not. So you have to identify what is missing. And you Sorry? So you have to identify what is missing in order to know how to proceed. Maybe this is why what Anastasius uh, mentioned is what uh, they have and uh, what they need to find, like an uh, organized curriculum in order to know how to work. We have the talent, but we don't have that. Why I was asking about resources. or so the main thing for me is the program because Probably they do have the passion. For sure, they don't have the resources, so they need some help there. But uh, they need also well experienced professionals, professionals in order to, to organize a program in these countries, in this part of the world. Anastasios, do you agree? Uh, so so yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, all your uh, inputs. Uh, so the thing is, the beauty of this is there is no magic stick or a magic formula. Uh, okay. I agree that everything is important. So passion is 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 crucial, and resources are crucial, and also other elements. Uh, but and that's the beauty. Otherwise, every country would have copied and pasted what other countries do, and everybody would be successful. But that that's not how it works. Um, so and then is based on the nation, based on culture is very important. Joe mentioned that uh, earlier or hinted towards that side earlier. So culture, because when he came from US to, to Spain, culture around basketball is completely different. So Greece has a different culture, UK has a different culture around basketball, or try to find and, and form a culture. And this is influenced by different factors. Uh, so in an ideal world, yes, facilities, infrastructure, uh, coaching, well-structured programs, uh, competition, how we can engage the community around basketball, uh, inclusive participation, because we can see, still see in some countries, uh, there are some barriers, uh, you know, cultural barriers, uh, stereotypical barriers might say that, oh, uh, basketball is a men's sport. Uh, some people say it shouldn't be played by women. Uh, 
uh, or others can say that, uh, for example, uh, basketball uh, is just for people from uh, BME backgrounds, black and minority ethnicity backgrounds, for example. Uh, but uh, it has to be inclusive because the, the biggest the base is, the more likely is to have uh, more on the elite level and so on. Uh, education and life skills is very important. As we discussed uh, earlier, as you very well mentioned, uh, it's, just, it's not just basketball and, and uh, you know, making success in terms of uh, outcomes and, uh, and wins. It's about in the long run, how we can make better people, how we can develop life skills through basketball. Uh, and they can follow the young people no matter what they do in their life. And that will make them better fans uh, in the future, stay around the, the sport, uh, try to bring their future kids in the sport. So everything is more healthy rather than having, you know, uh, big rivalries and, and fans and, and so on. Like we have in some countries, it's like a, uh, sometimes it's like a battlefield, not, not, not like, a, like a basketball game. So talent identification is also very important how we can build uh, strategic partnerships to, to, to support all this environment. And obviously sustainability. So the, if, if the, the programs are not sustainable financially, uh, they can continue so, and they can be successful. So this, in an ideal world, a program that incorporates all those uh, aspects to a good uh, extent uh, is more likely to be successful. But as I said before, there's no magic formula. Every, every country needs to, to see what works the best for them and what and to the best based on the resources that they have, financial and people resources to, to do their best. So probably for what I understand, the sharing of knowledge is most important than uh, providing funds to developing countries to in order to progress in, in basketball. I could speak as a from a coach's point of view, and uh, the best coaches uh, are the ones that have uh, the knowledge. Uh, the second thing they they need to have it's how to pass that knowledge to the players. Uh, and the third thing they need to have is uh, the love for their players. Maybe the the two first things they might they might lack the ability of, of passing the knowledge, and they might lack uh, they might lack the knowledge itself. But if they just love their players and the kids, they can do they can do great things with them. So, so sometimes in, in my experience, it's difficult to love some of the kids nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> because, because it's not like, I don't think it's like when we were young, you know, like when we were the young, there was a lot more respect for our elders. A lot, there's a lot more respect for our authority than there is nowadays. And I'm not saying that there isn't, it's, I'm not saying it's a bad society, but it's a different society in today's age and and you see a lot of kids that unfortunately don't want to learn they don't want to listen they're just there they're just there okay. physically and they're and they're not there emotionally or mentally and okay. and it makes it more difficult as just said is to transmit these things you know no matter how much you can love these kids if they don't want to learn nowadays they don't learn when i was on the court it was like man i i was like a sponge i wanted to absorb everything you know but um but society's changed. So, Joseph, I think those three things you said are perfect. But it's almost like you're, we're dealing with a different society different to, transmit, era. Right. to transmit our love, our passion, and our knowledge in the same way. Because to transmit love, passion, and knowledge, somebody has to be accepting of that. And when they are, as you know, as a coach, it's an incredible feeling. You love that player even more so. And uh, and then it's easier to it's e easier to to share your experiences with them, but sometimes the more the years go on, the more difficult I find it to to relate to some of the attitudes and some of the players of the of that 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 play for me sometimes. Do you believe then that in the developed countries, children lack uh, they don't want to try 
they, they have other interests. So they are, they are just in order to, to play some basketball and not become a basketball player. And this is not the case in the developing countries, maybe. Maybe here in uh, Europe or in the Western world, uh, children have everything in their life. They are not willing to sweat every day in practice. <laughs> Maybe this is something that we find it in the developing countries. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Sometimes, yes. Uh, and uh, it's uh, that, that's one of the privileges or maybe uh, people and young people that they uh, grow up in developing countries or less affluent countries. Uh, they face bigger challenges in their lives. They don't have all the other, you know, uh, stressors or other interests uh, to to lack focus on, and uh, they are more resilient. So, in developing countries, we can see young people uh, overcoming challenges from because, uh, you know, as simple as that, their parents might don't even have uh, uh, food. So, overcoming, having the ability to to overcome adversity and uh, and develop resilience and uh, you know try your best to be the best you can be uh, all these are you know especially in sport because as we know you 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 will lose more times than you win uh, and through that process you you become tougher you become stronger and that is not just on the court it's just in life and when your career finishes if you're lucky enough to have a career in basketball but you, you will have a life so this, those are skills that you, you can transfer no matter what you do in your life, your, your professional career. And is something that every employer is looking at the moment. So it's just the personal attributes that you can't teach or it takes, you know, you develop them throughout those years. Uh, knowledge, you, you can get knowledge, especially now with the technology, with the internet, knowledge is there. If you want to get it, go and get it. But all those, you know, personal characteristics and attributes they're very, very, very hard to develop and it takes time. And especially it's very important the development of those developmental ages. So I, I had one last question, but I believe that we already answered the question. If it is very bold, not only in the developing countries, but in the developed also, uh, our goal should be to make better people or better athletes through basketball or through any other sport. Let's have Joseph's thoughts. As uh, a this, is the first, this is the first thing. Uh, better people, for sure. Uh, no, the, the smallest percent is gonna, a small percent percentage is gonna play a professional basketball or they're gonna have a professional career. Um, but we we want to make sure we bring uh, good people for the for the society. So Anastasio's life skills, uh, I, I would, characters or better. Uh, obviously, we we are in basketball. We love basketball, so we use the basketball as vehicle to for change. Uh, so our aim is to develop both. So develop. I think those two needs to go uh, alongside. So we need to develop better players, but throughout this process, better people. So, and that goes down to, and goes back to developing a robust cu curriculum when we uh, of the youth basketball program. That needs to include, obviously, the performance side, which is based on the, you know, the sport development pyramid, you know, foundational level, participation, performance to elite level. Uh, so how we can support uh, every young person throughout this journey. And then also, uh, as alongside with this, uh, to develop us better uh, personalities, so social skills, so communication. Um, also, having been comfortable to get out of their comfort zones and try new things, uh, make choices. Uh, and also, everything is competitive in this life. So they will face competition in the future to get a job, to go to university. So if you learn how to be competitive through basketball, you will be competitive for life. Although all the players, all public figures like you, 
can they act as role models toward this direction to build better characters, to not only have better players, but also better characters with ethos and the, uh, in order to build a better society. Yeah, first of all, the comment on the, before I, you know, I always wish that I was able to sing, you know, like I always wish that I was able to be a rock and roll singer because when you see the Rolling Stones still, you know, doing new concert tours when they're 85 years old, man, as an ex-athlete, I had to finish the game. Like, I can't even go out and play basketball right now. And these guys are still like rock and roll and and they have this career that goes forever, you know. But I think like Joseph and Anastasia was saying, you know, if you become a professional athlete, this ends and it ends way quicker than it ever than, than you could ever remember. Because, you know, I'm 58 now. I was 35 when I finished playing. That's 23 years that I've been finished playing basketball. And I played for 12. So it's almost double the amount of time that I'm living now that I, I had a professional career in basketball. So when we talk about what we talked about earlier is it's obvious that the most important thing that you try to do as a mentor, and we'll go back to the beginning, is give family values, life values, competition values, not only how to compete, but how to accept loss and how to accept rejection. Because as you get older and you go get that new job or you go for that new job or you get fired, because I always talk about NBA was one of my dreams. But for some reason, when I got to the NBA and they released me four months into it from Sacramento Kings and it was the worst day of my life, that part of the dream was never that I never arrived at that part of the dream, you know? So by developing these kids now to compete, to learn how to win, to learn how to lose, to learn how to stay. I always say straight line, no matter what, you know, I, everybody talks about the game that I made 63 points. You know what I remember? I remember the Sunday after that game, I scored 19 points and we lost to Barcelona, you know, and I played a terrible game. So those are the things that you have to teach kids how to stay like even leveled. You know, one day I'm not here. I'm not the best. And when I'm down here, I'm not the worst either. And I think that's what develops kids. And that's what develops young adults into, into good human beings. And, and as I said, I think we're finishing up now. So I just want to thank you guys for, for giving me some of your personal insight. I think it was good for me to, to listen to and hear. And, um, and Theodore, I want to thank you also for, for having me and, and monitoring this whole thing. I know I do this. I do this quite often around table. It's not very easy to do sometimes when you have people like me that don't stop talking. <laughs> uh, this makes my job easier, and I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's true. That's true. <laughs> couldn't imagine a better close for uh, today's discussion about this that we all agree to provide uh, to children life skills because uh, their, their athletic career maybe. It will be a very important part of their lives, but probably will be the smallest. So it is what they do after their career in sports that matters. And uh, this is why I couldn't imagine the better uh, closure for tonight's, uh, for today's uh, discussion. Thank you all. I'm yeah. very honored to be in the same panel. Uh, with you and i hope that we met in person uh, anytime uh, soon or if you visit athens i will be glad to see you here in the american college of greece thank you, uh, can, course, can, uh, you. can i just get the assist from from joe and to finish up with <laughs> that was a perfect assist we changed role here so i used to play the shooting guard but yeah so you you gave me the alley-oop now so <laughs> okay for your you, point, gotta, you gotta dunk it then you gotta dunk it yeah, uh, yeah let's see gravity i can feel the gravity no, again, <laughs> but yeah no no not as much my back hairs uh, so it's very important for for uh, for a youth basketball program to to stress the importance of preparing athletes for failure so we it's very important to spend as much time preparing the players for the possibility that they might not become professionals as you do preparing them to become professionals and i want to close he has to talk to the their parents also oh yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs>
the parents are the ones that have the most expectations for the children. Or the mother of baby, maybe. <laughs> That's another runner. Parents and parents and, and kids in sports. Like managing expectations, that's another big one. But yeah, I think it's a very complex topic. We we can go ahead for, for days, I think. For days, for days. Yeah, yeah, for days. So a big thank, thank you. Guys. I appreciate it. To all of you and to the organizers, of course, and uh, very good luck to the conference. Thank you all. Thank Hope you. to see you soon again. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.